Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel, The Dissenter. Today my guest is Dr. Jerry Muller. Dr. Jerry Muller is Ordinary Professor of, Psycholo of History sorry, at the Catholic University of America, where he teaches courses on historical and contemporary subjects, including capitalism, nationalism, conservatism, the history of social, political, economic and religious thought, and modern German and Jewish history. He is also the author of books like The Mind and the Market, Capitalism and the Jews, and the most recent one, The Tyranny of Metrics. Dr. Muller, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's my pleasure. Okay, great. So today we'll, we'll be talking about capitalism and a bit of its history and philosophy, let's say. So the first question, question I would like to pose you is, uh, did England have a set of ideal circumstances for the Industrial Revolution to first take off there? And I'm asking you this because, of course, capitalism is very intimately related to the Industrial Revolution. Yes, well, a few things should be said about that. Uh, I've been much influenced in my own thinking by the work of the historian Joel Mokir, who a few years ago published a book called The Enlightened Economy, which is about British economic and technological history uh, in the in the nineteenth and in the late eighteenth and nineteenth centuries, and I think is really a a masterpiece of historical and social scientific explanation. And uh, among the things that he says are that, in addition to an uh, two things, I think, that uh, are particularly important. First of all, Britain was already a very commercial society before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that is to say, in the three centuries from 1450 to 1750 or so, it, it was already a deeply commercial society in which there was a great deal of um, division of labor, there was a great deal of commerce, it was relatively open in terms of the ability of people from various classes to rise. Uh, uh, and and Mokir makes a distinction, I think it's a really good one, between what he calls Smithian growth and Schumpetrian growth. So Smithian growth is named after Adam Smith. And the notion is that it's a kind of low level of ongoing economic growth that occurs when you have a reasonably well-functioning market economy with uh, protection of property rights and a developed credit system and uh, and so on. Uh, but Schumpetrian growth is a much higher level of economic growth, say two or three or four or more percent. And that takes place at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And that, he says, and I think there's a lot to this, is based on the application of scientific knowledge, but the wide diffusion of practical knowledge um, among a substantial portion of the population that is able to use that practical knowledge to innovate and create new forms of economic growth. So part of it has to do with, uh, as he thinks, and I think he's right, um, the spread of certain enlightenment ideas about the utility of practical knowledge, about the fact that innovation is a good thing. This is something that um, Deidre McCloskey has written a lot about, about the, uh, the cultural establishment of the idea that innovation is legitimate, which is not usually the case in most past societies. So Mokir's uh, sort of bottom line is that the Industrial Revolution would have occurred somewhere in Europe, probably in Western Europe, eventually, because of these larger factors having to do with the spread of enlightenment ideas about practical knowledge on the one hand, innovation, and the legitimacy of commerce and trade. Uh, but then there are a number of particular factors that made it um, happen first in England, and some of those have to do with what I've already referred to as a relatively open social structure with an aristocracy, for example, that was actually quite interested in commerce, uh, the fact that you had a rather reasonably well-developed um, legal system and a state that was capable of protecting private property, uh, the fact that you already had uh, well-developed commerce, uh, 
part of it because of the development of the internal market, part of it because of the development of the colonial market in previous centuries. Uh, so all of those things and no doubt more come together uh, in a way that made Great Britain first to industrialize. But as, as, as Mokir says, and I think he's right, uh, a number of the broader factors uh, would, would apply to a good deal of Western Europe as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now moving on to the very beginning of capitalism and the philosophical side of things. That yes. is, uh, from its very inception, let's say, uh, the most prominent philosophers, at least in Europe, felt the need to talk about and to express their thoughts about uh, the way capitalism might influence several aspects of society, of course, economy, but even moral values and politics. So, uh, could you give us a brief account of the way uh, an intellectual confrontation, for example, between uh, people like Voltaire and Rousseau went along uh, and what were their views of capitalism? Okay, well, first I should say they didn't use the term capitalism. They usually, they typically use the term, uh, well, Rousseau uses a number of terms, but basically they talked about commerce, uh, or in case of when we get a little bit later to Adam Smith, uh, they ta uh, Smith talks about a commercial society. But by commercial society, he means more or less what we tend to mean by capitalism. Uh, so the the phenomenon precedes the term, as so often in uh, as so often in history, and intellectuals had been talking about the ramifications of the growth of commerce uh, since uh, at least the 17th century. Uh, so there was already a you know developing discussion about it. It was pretty important in Hobbes and in Locke and. Uh, and uh, a number of uh, French thinkers, but by the time you get to the the middle of the 18th century, when we're talking, or the, first, the second and third quarters of the 18th century, when we're when we're talking about Voltaire and Rousseau, uh, there are a number of debates going on in which they present uh, opposing views. So Voltaire, for example, has a few is very much in favor of commerce. Uh, not least because of its social and cultural effects. And two of the arguments that he uses are, first of all, that commerce is conducive to toleration. Because like many 18th century thinkers and 17th century thinkers, he was very much concerned with limiting the effects of uh, religious enthusiasm, religious zeal, and religiously based civil war. And he makes the argument in his letters on England that commerce allows people of differing religions, or we might say more broadly, differing cultural orientations, to cooperate with one another without them agreeing on ultimate goals like the nature of salvation, and allows them to do it because they're focused on making money. And as long as that works in terms of their interactions, um, they're willing to deal with one another. So, first Voltaire makes this argument that capitalism is conducive to toleration. And secondly, he makes an argument that is very important for David Hume and others as well, and that is that economic growth is important because it really makes possible not only an improved standard of living for many people, but makes possible the, but a, a basic accumulation of wealth is a necessity for the higher arts and sciences. So you can't really have culture uh, until you have some accumulation of wealth. Uh, and the third argument that, uh, that Voltaire makes is that this was at a time when a lot of moralists, religious moralists and some secular moralists would condemn uh, the growth of commercial society on the grounds that it leads to luxury and to wants that we don't really, it leads to the growth of wants that we don't, that aren't natural to us and that are artificial. And Voltaire says that's a perfectly good thing and many of the things that we take for granted, uh, that we don't consider to be luxuries, that we consider to be necessities, like using a scissors, 
uh, are themselves a product of commercial development. So that many of the good things in life, from scissors to books to coffee and tea in the 18th century, are actually a result of uh, commerce and and the, the spread of commodities that were once considered to be luxuries that over time increasingly come to be seen as necessities. So then Rousseau has a counter set of arguments. Um, he says, on the one hand, commerce uh, does lead to the growth of our wants, but those are artificial wants, and they're wants that, first of all, make us less, and they're wants that make us less happy, because on the one hand, uh, they make us um, less independent. We have to work for others in order to get the money to buy the things that we now want. And secondly, they make us less happy, or they make many of us less happy, because we compare ourselves to others. Uh, and when we compare ourselves to others in terms of their wealth and status and so on, because some people are naturally more uh, talented than others, some people are going to get ahead more than others, and they're going to have more wealth, and they're going to have more worldly goods, and they're going to have more status. And the more we're concerned about how we compare our status to theirs, the more dissatisfied those of us who aren't of high status are going to be. So Rousseau tends to see the growth of commerce as leading to greater interdependence. Uh, so from his point of view, that means people are less independent, less autonomous, uh, and also to greater psychic dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's interesting. And because we're talking about capitalism, we can't avoid the figure, and you already referred shortly to him, uh, of Adam Smith. Uh, could you please clarify what, we, what he meant by the invisible hand of the market? Because there are a lot of people that interpret these as being sort of laissez-faire market capitalism, completely unregulated and... Uh, and that the, he would believe that um, um, capitalism sort of magically would create economic growth just by virtue of each element of it, each individual that participates of, uh, in it, pursuing his or her own self-interest. So is it really like that? So the interesting thing about Adam Smith is in some ways he's responding to something else that Rousseau says, which is that in a commercial society, as Rousseau sees it, uh, the rich live at the expense of the poor. So the rich get better off and the poor are immersed in poverty. And Smith says empirically that's not the case. And more importantly, it doesn't have to be the case if you have a properly structured capitalist economy and polity. And that's really what the wealth of nations is about. It's about what forms of commerce are negative from a, uh, from a, from a cultural and moral point of view, like slavery, uh, and about how can institutions be structured in a way that brings about what he called universal opulence. By universal opulence, he means a situation in which uh, more and more people are better and better off because the system produces more commodities at lesser price at lower prices so that more and more people can afford them that's really what smith is talking about primarily as a as a positive goal in the wealth of nations though he thinks that has some uh, potentially negative effects too so uh, the, so the wealth of nations then is about this, uh, w one of the key metaphors in the wealth of nations uh, is this idea of an invisible hand. And there's nothing mysterious about the invisible hand, there's nothing divine about it, there's been a lot of bad scholarship about that. But if you just read the book carefully, you see what Smith means by the invisible hand is the unintended positive consequences of social action in the economic realm. And just to go through the arguments very briefly to make clear primarily what he means by that, he means that if people pursue their, if you, if you assume that people in the marketplace 
uh, if you assume that people have altruism, but their altruism is limited, that is, they're more altruistic, they're more what he would call beneficent towards people who they know and care about. But uh, a, a, a commercial society, especially in an advanced commercial society, is based on getting all sorts of things from people who we don't know and have no altruistic uh, uh, affections for. So the question is, how does such an economy work towards creating universal opulence? Uh, and Smith says it's based on the motivation of self-interest. Uh, and self-interest can have positive effects and negative effects, and it does in The Wealth of Nations. He shows both. But it can have positive effects in this sense. If you take self-interest and you force people to trade in the marketplace uh, for the goods that they want, uh, then trade makes possible a greater division of labor. So more people can specialize, more people can innovate, and so on. That makes possible much greater productivity. So self-interest through these mechanisms of trade can lead to much greater productivity. And then there's the question of how is that much greater productivity going to uh, make its way to the larger populace to create this universal opulence. And there Smith shows that if you have a competitive market, over time, the price of goods will go down to the lowest level at which they can be produced in that society. So you'll have a more productive economy, you'll have the prices of goods going down and that over time and that will make it possible for more and more people to be supplied with more and more goods that will improve their quality of life and that's primarily what Smith means by the invisible hand. So it's the unintended positive consequences of economic action. Now what he doesn't mean is that self-interest always leads to positive social outcomes. And a lot of the wealth of nations is about the way in which self-interest, when it's not channeled through the market, leads to negative social outcomes. Uh, so that if people uh, can, uh, if individuals or companies or groups of people like guilds can influence the government to limit uh, the free trade of goods, uh, that will be, that might benefit that group of producers or merchants, but at the expense of everybody else because then how they'll have to pay more for those goods. And then Smith also deals with uh, negative consequences of even a well-functioning market economy that he thinks people in society have to think about and government should do something about. So most famously in Book Five of the Wealth of Nations, he deals with the fact that. One of, the one of the negative effects of this greater division of labor. If people are sort of working on an assembly line, like in the pin factory at the beginning of the Wealth of Nations, where each person only does one particular action that they're, they become very skilled at and very good at, but he says that can lead to a kind of uh, mental atrophy, kind of mental retardation, because the range of things that one thinks about is so limited. And he was living at a time when many children uh, didn't get an education. They went right to work in the farms or they went right to work in factories. So, one, so among the things that he recommends are instituting a kind of system of universal general education for everybody, which was a very radical idea in his time. But what's most interesting, I think, in terms of um, thinking about the utility of Smith's thought is not what he thought about particular issues, but the larger way in which he thinks about these issues. So he thinks about how commerce can have positive effects and how it can have negative effects as in the case of slavery or how it can have positive economic effects but negative effects on people's cultural growth as in the case of this uh, mental stunting and what government and other organizations in society uh, ought to do to try to combat that. And that I think remains a very useful way of thinking about um, the interconnection between economics and politics and social matters.
Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that was a very important clarification <laughs> about Adam Smith's thoughts on capitalism because they are really very badly handled by several people nowadays. But okay, so now to move on to, to another specific topic that is uh, in the 18th and 19th century that were several people who reacted uh, negative, negatively, who had a sort of uh, reactionary response to capitalism and mm -hmm. one of them was Eustus Moser. So mm -hmm. could, could you talk about the specific criticisms from a conservative standpoint uh, that Eustus Moser uh, did to capitalism? Sure. So Eustace Moser was a, uh, a an official in a small uh, city in a small state in Westphalia in the second half of the uh, 18th century. He was also uh, a writer who wrote about who wrote in newspapers and so on to try to um, uh, try to get people to think about larger issues of public policy. In that sense, he's very much part of the Enlightenment. Uh, but uh, for Mercer, as a, as a state administrator in this uh, in this small, uh, uh, partly urban, partly rural state, um, what, one of the things that he's struck by is how much the spread of the international market is destabilizing to the existing social structure. So peddlers, who are an important um, form of the spread of uh, the market in societies with underdeveloped markets because they bring commodities from outside the area, uh, they bring them to rural areas and so on. Um, they bring in these goods and they expose the peasants to new wants. To They show women uh, buttons and uh, and uh, ribbons and all kinds of things that they might want to buy, and that makes them um, that inc that increases their wants in a way that he thinks is uh, destabilizing. Also, and this is of even greater concern to him, uh, goods that are produced in the way that Smith described through the division of labor can be made more cheaply than through the artisanal way in which they're produced in a place like uh, the part of Westphalia that, uh, that Moser was living in. So this importation of cheaper goods destroys the livelihood of a very important uh, portion of the population, the portion that are, that are the artisans, who in many ways are sort of the backbone of the town economy. So Moser is struck by the destabilizing effects of uh, the spread of the international market on the social structure and culture of this rather economically backward part of Europe in which he's living. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's interesting. And another major figure in the history of the criticisms that capitalism received, and we, we would at least nowadays put on the opposite uh, political pole uh, in comparison with Eustace Moser, for example, is Marx. Would you like yes. perhaps to talk a little bit about Marx's criticisms to capitalism uh, and tell us if uh, they are still somewhat relevant nowadays or if they would only be applied to uh, things as they were back then in the 19th century? Yeah, well, there are th important elements of the nature of capitalism that uh, Marx and his collaborator Engels gets wrong. Uh, and then there are a few important things that they get right. Uh, so a, a lot of the things that they get wrong have to do with, first of all, the labor theory of value, the notion that it's really only people who produce with their hands uh, and through the spread of their, the sweat of their brow. So he's thinking primarily of uh, you know, factory workers who are the real sources of uh, economic productivity and that everybody else, uh, that is those who supervise them, uh, those who, uh, who buy their labor through paying them wages, 
that is to say the capitalists, that those people are unproductive and essentially parasitic. Uh, that's that's wrong on all sorts of levels. Uh, they're also wrong. They were also wrong in their predictions. They thought that capitalism was going to lead to the um, immiseration of the bulk of the population. Uh, that didn't happen either. And they also thought that capitalism was going to lead to a social structure where there were a small group of people who owned capital and there was and who would be very well off and there would be a very large group of people who didn't own any capital who would be the proletariat in in marxist terms and who would be uh as i say um uh impoverished really and whose quality of life would be very low so those things didn't happen uh let's talk about a couple of the things that they got right or at least that were important insights. So there are parts of the Communist Manifesto in particular, uh, but also some other parts of Marx's writing that focus on the fact that capitalism is very dynamic. That is, it's based because people who own capital are searching for higher returns on their capital, uh, they engage in all sorts of innovation. So uh engaging in economic uh, uh activity in new markets or producing new products in new ways uh all of this mark says is uh is radical and a constant revolutionizing of the way in which things are made and produced and distributed and therefore are constantly uh um making people insecure they're tra they're transforming forms of work so that older forms of work uh, are no longer economically viable. Old ways of doing things are no longer viable. So, so all that is, as in one English translation from the Communist Manifesto, uh, all that is solid melts into air. So this dynamic revolutionary element of capitalism is something that uh, Marx captured really quite brilliantly, and that later theoreticians like Joseph Schumpeter would pick up on. The second thing that I think that Marx uh, and Engels got right um, is that there will be ongoing attempts by those who own capital to try to squeeze labor in order to make more profit. So they'll try to get people to work harder or more intensely or longer uh, for the lowest wages that uh, that uh, those who um, are offering work in the in the uh, uh, those who are hiring labor sorry can get that's an ongoing dynamic uh, and uh, on the whole you know the val the value of what people who work for a living in capitalist societies can get um, with their money has gone up and they've had all sorts of improvements in their standards of health and living and so on. But this constant attempt to squeeze more out of people in the interests of uh, capital or what's sometimes called economic efficiency is something that Marx points to uh, and writes about at length in, uh, in Capital. And you certainly still see it Nowadays, I mean, you see it in ever new forms from generation to generation, but now you see it, for example, in uh, the decline in ongoing permanent jobs and the rise of part-time labor, sometimes known as the gig economy. It goes under a number of names. Uh, and that has some advantages, but it has disadvantages in terms of uh, the stability and predictability of people's income over time. So, so, so as I say, there's a lot that Marx got wrong, but there are some fundamental dynamics of capitalism that he focused on that are still worth remembering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we've got thinkers that were opposed to capitalism and thinkers that were for capitalism, but would you agree with the following assessment that uh, at least all of them seem to agree that capitalism allowed for an exponential increase in production and also in economic growth. 
Uh, and the, se the second thing that I will say now, uh, I don't know if it's really correct, but uh, that apart from the market and the market values, if there are any, people would also always need if not counter market, at least non market institutions mm -hmm. uh, for for them to have a, to lead a proper life. Let's say them uh, and them being the family, the state, the nation, other cultural uh, institutions, and so on. W would you agree with with this? Yes, I think the best, uh, the most insightful thinkers have recognized one or another element of both of those that capitalism is. Uh, tremendously productive, that it's made at least the possibility of a uh, better standard of living available to more and more people. And certainly uh, in the course of the last, you know, th 40 years or so, that's particularly been the case. If you look internationally at the, the number of people who have been, um, who have emerged from what we might call absolute poverty to something above absolute poverty um, has increased faster than at any time in history. People in advanced industrial societies often don't notice this because it's happened above all in China and to a lesser degree in India and some other places. Uh, but if you look at the world as a whole, um, that's, certainly, that's certainly the case. Uh, but then, as you say, and uh, this is really one of the big themes of my of the book, uh, The Mind and the Market, but I think if anybody really thinks carefully about uh, sort of the moral and cultural nature of capitalist societies, uh, uh, the best thinkers have tended to see that insofar as the market is based on the pursuit of self-interest, uh, and as I say, Smith showed how that could lead to very positive outcomes. But, a so but he also showed that it, could, it did lead to some negative outcomes that required intervention by the state. So I mentioned education already. There's also the whole issue of national defense, which doesn't come about sort of spontaneously through a capitalist economy. So you often have, you know, capitalist economies getting conquered by other countries uh, unless they spend money on defense. Uh, uh, so there are lots of roles of the state. Uh, there's also, of course, the role of the state in um, enforcing property rights, which are fundamental to capitalism, but don't exist uh, in a state of nature and don't exist when there's not a well-functioning state. So the state is a prerequisite for capitalism in that sense as well. But then if you assume as many of these people do, that much of market activity is based on self-interest. Then there's the question of, uh, do you want to have people who view all areas of their life purely in terms of their self-interest? And as numerous thinkers pointed out, from Hegel to Schumpeter, uh, if, uh, a fa if, uh, if you have family, if you have a family life, where each individual is pursuing their self-interest, you don't have a family for very long. Uh, and the family, when it's functioning well, is an important counter to the market in that it creates people who uh, care about, care intensely about others, often engage in economic activity for the sake of their family. So it creates more altruistic people also gives people a sense of ongoing identity and security that they might not get in the market. Uh, so you need institutions like that. Uh, also, as many thinkers pointed out, and here they're building on something that Rousseau said, uh, you know, in a market economy, people are always trying to sell you stuff. So they are trying to increase your wants or suggesting that there are things that you didn't know that you need, but they're going to try to convince you that you need. And if you, and sometimes those are good ideas, sometimes they're not. But if you don't have a sense of what you need, independent of what people in the market are trying to sell you, then you can spend your whole life uh, essentially trying to make more and more money so that you can buy more and more things. And that, as Adam Smith and many others have pointed out, is a very unsatisfying mode of existence. So many thinkers have pointed to uh, other 
uh, social organizations like guilds or professional associations or religious associations that give people a sense of what's of how to limit their wants even within a capitalist society so on all these oh and then you you need some people like Adam Smith um, to think about what are the larger implications of what's going on in the capitalist society? In other words, you need a certain level of culture and intellectuals who are actually not self-interested, who are interested in the public good, and who can reflect upon and make suggestions about changes that needed, need to be made uh, in the market or in government or in culture to uh, help obviate or alleviate some of the negative effects of the market economy and take advantages of the positive elements. So educational institutions uh, like schools, uh, universities, and so on, those can often also play an important role in showing people, first of all, in explaining to people how the market works and in showing them the limits of a kind of narrow, self-interested or economistic view of life. Mm -hmm. Very well. So we've been talking uh, here about capitalism, but I think there's a very important thing for people to know that is uh, capitalism is not really a single entity, right? There are varieties of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, there we have, for example, state-guided capitalism, entrepreneurial capitalism, social democratic capitalism, liberal capitalism. So would you say that the correct way to look at capitalism is to evaluate it as it is manifested in each set of circumstances? Yes, I think that's very important. I mean, cap yeah, capitalism is, a, is an ideal type. Uh, it's a model of, that we use to characterize certain phenomenon of a, of a, of a market economy, a money-based economy, an economy based on private property, an economy in which uh, prices are set primarily by supply and demand. Uh, uh, but there are many, many variations on that. You've mentioned some of them. So state-guided capitalism in the way that you uh, arguably uh, have had in China since about uh, in mainland China since about uh, 1979, um, uh, all kinds of social democratic forms of capitalism. I mean, basically any capitalist society that is combined with democracy will lead almost inevitably over time to some form or another of a welfare state in order to uh, help reduce some of those insecurities that come with life in general, but come with capitalism in particular. So old age insurance, uh, accident insurance, health insurance, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and some society, some countries obviously have that to a greater degree than others. Uh, there are some in which you have this very entrepreneurial form of capitalism where innovation is either permitted or encouraged. So in the United States, for example, you know, what, with the in many ways, one of, the mo one, of the, one of the most radical changes in the last 15 years has been the rise of the shale economy. That is the extraction of oil and natural gas from shale, uh, which is having all sorts of ramifications in the American economy and internationally. Well, that's possible in good part because of the nature of property rights in the United States, uh, because there is this culture of, um, of engineering innovation and so on. Uh, there, are other society, uh, there are other societies that are very entrepreneurial too. One thinks of contemporary Israel, for example, uh, where you have a lot of um, startups and innovative companies uh, in the um, medical space, uh, medical devices, in cybersecurity, and so on. Uh, then you have other, so other societies that are less oriented towards innovation. Uh, but uh, they may work perfectly well, too. It depends a lot on the particular culture of the particular society, of where it is in the sort of international division of labor at any given time. So it's very important to keep in, although we've been talking a lot about capitalism in general, it's really important to keep in mind that there are many varieties of capitalism and that even within each country, 
uh, they change over time. So in China, for example, while it's still very much a state-guided system, it has moved towards a more market economy and more innovative economy uh, over time. And uh, in the United States, uh, you know, to some degree under Trump is, is not so much the reality yet, but the vision is of a more state-guided economy where the state decides uh, to protect certain industries uh, for the sake of social stability and so on. It hasn't happened yet, but that's the concept at least. Uh, so these things are dynamic uh, over time in each society as well. Mm -hmm. So what we can take from all that you just said is that uh, we can't really say that uh, this one variety of capitalism is unconditionally superior to all the others, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. A lot of it depends on, on culture, on the size of the country, on the degree of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. So, for example, small countries that until very recently were very culturally homogeneous, like the Scandinavian countries, uh, tend to be more egalitarian. Uh, I mean, they're highly capitalist, but then the government is also highly redistributionist. Uh, the, as a broad generalization, it seems that the more ethnically and culturally heterogeneous a society is, uh, the less of that that you have, uh, the less redistribution that you have through government. Um, there's a lot of uh, social scientific work on that, but um, so it depends on it depends on many of these factors. There's there's no one formula that works for all countries, and there's no one formula that works for any individual country continuously over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and the next question I would like to ask you, because you've studied, of course, a lot of, about capitalism, and that is, what is your take on economic inequality? Because uh, at least nowadays, it seems to me that throughout the political spectrum, all people at least agree that from a certain point on economic inequality is problematic, at least at a societal level. Uh, and it can generate uh, societal incohesion and things like that. Uh, but there are also people that think that, uh, let's say, if the tide elevates all the boats, even if uh, economic inequality increases with time, if even the people that live at the bottom, let's say, still have uh, a, good, uh, a good life quality, let's say, that it's really not problematic. So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so this really shows us how a lot of those 18th century debates between Voltaire and Rousseau and Adam Smith about what's really important is it is it the standard of living of the lowest part of the pop of the bulk of the population which was adam smith's concern is any degree of inequality intrinsically bad for people in the way that rousseau would say um uh so there are you know there are broad philosophical issues on the one hand and then on the other hand there are more narrow um economic issues such as the fact that although internationally inequality has been decreasing in the last 30 years that is to say countries huge countries that were very poor like china and india are now now now, now, now much less so and in that sense they've become more equal to the advanced industrial capitalist societies uh, on the other hand you've had a greater degree of inequality created within most societies, certainly in places like China and India, and also in countries in Europe and uh, Canada and the United States, uh, in good part because of, on the one hand, because of technological processes that create greater advantages for capital and make repetitive kinds of labor um, less and less uh, worth less and less in the marketplace because people can be replaced by various kinds of robots and automation. And on the other hand, precisely that globalization of uh, labor and production has meant that people who engaged in um, uh, 
in many forms of work that can be done more cheaply in China or India or now in Vietnam or whatever, uh, those people have seen the relative value of their labor decline. And on the other hand, those people who uh, are parts of the most um, internationalized and uh, globalized parts of the economy uh, have seen their income increase. So you've had a decrease in inequality internationally, but you've had an increase in inequality in most countries of the world, even though you've had this huge rise in the standard of living of hundreds of millions of people um, in recent uh, decades. So, uh, but it has led in many societies and certainly in, um, certainly in, in the United States and England and other of the most, you might say, entrepreneurially um, oriented societies has, has led to a greater degree of economic inequality. There's no doubt about that. So on the one hand, we have the moral issues. On the other hand, we have the economic issues. Uh, and th and th that doesn't mean, by the way, that people's, um, that how much th they can buy with their wages has declined much for most of them, because it hasn't. Um, ex in fact, I think there's good arguments that it's gone up. But the relative level of inequality has certainly increased. And then, and the degree, and this brings us back to the dynamic element of capitalism, the degree of instability in people's lives for many people has increased. So you put those things all together and then that brings us to the political aspect. That is how are people, how satisfied are people gonna be in this situation where they may be economically, in terms of the things that they can buy, uh, as well off or even better off in many respects. I mean. 30 years ago, I mean, you and I are making a telephone call and that we're talking to each other now essentially for free, right? Something right. that uh, 30 years ago, A, would have been impossible to talk to each other and see one another. And if we wanted to talk to each other on the phone, it would have cost us a, for an hour, it would have cost us a small fortune, right? Now we take for granted that we can do these kinds of things. Uh, people in the United States who are considered poor often have cell phones and televisions and cable service and air conditioning, which is really important if, if in the southern half of the United States. Uh, so these are people that we consider, so it gets back to that 18th century debate about uh, things that were once considered luxury are now considered to be necessities that most people, even not very well-off people, uh, continue to have. But as so part of it, so part of the political question is to what degree will people want the government to insulate them either from the effects of inequality or I think this is a bigger question from the effects of this greater insecurity uh, that comes with a more dynamic and globalized economy. Uh, so I, I think the notion that just because there's more inequality that that's necessarily bad and problematic, um, I think is a dubious argument. I mean, there are more sophisticated arguments that argue, for example, that a society with a lot of inequality will give too much political power to those with a lot of wealth, and that they will then be able to manipulate government in their own interests. I think that's an important argument and partially a valid one, though different countries regulate the amount that uh, wealth can play in politics to varying degrees. So in Canada, for example, uh, wealth plays a much, much smaller role in political life because of the nature of the campaign of the campaign contribution and so on than in the United States. So there's a lot of interacting factors here. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so perhaps the last question I would ask you is, you've recently published this book called The Tyranny of Metrics. Uh, could you tell us about the premise of that book, uh, how can metrics uh, become tyrannical and if capitalism has anything to do with this? Mm -hmm. So in some ways capitalism does uh, because uh, it's an, uh, my idea in the tyranny of metrics is that there's this phenomenon in a very wide range of contemporary organizations in business, 
organizations, in governmental organizations, but also in schools, universities, uh, in the army, uh, in policing, that is uh, that is based on the notion of what I call metric fixation. So metric fixation has a few elements to it. The first one is the notion that people's judgment is unreliable. Uh, it's biased. Uh, people make inexact estimates and so on. So you shouldn't rely on people's judgment. You shouldn't rely on experience. You should men you should measure performance. That only measured performance counts. Second idea that goes with metric fixation is the idea that you should reward and punish people based on their measured performance. Uh, and that if their measured performance is high, you should reward them either monetarily or in terms of rankings or league tables or whatever. And if their measured performance is inadequate, you should punish them in one way or another, either in terms of their reputation or monetarily and so on. And I try to show in the book how these ideas that seem intuitively plausible when they're actually executed in the world uh, uh, are often counterproductive, how they often lead to um, focusing on the things that can be measured as opposed to many important elements of organizations that can't be measured like mentoring others or cooperation, things like that, uh, it often leads to, uh, it often leads people to focus their activity on the things that are measured and, and rewarded at the expense of all sorts of other important elements of their job that aren't being measured and rewarded. It also leads people to devote a lot of their attention to trying to improve their metrics, not by making the organization better, but by gaming the metrics. So finding ways of improving the metrics in ways that don't really improve the organization. And in many organizations, to the extent that organizations function uh, in part on intrinsic motivation, that is people are interested in doing the work because they find the work itself interesting or because they find the purpose of their organization to be meaningful, like in a hospital wanting to heal people or in a school wanting to teach people to learn, um, this focus on measured and rewarded performance can lead to a decline in that intrinsic motivation so that the organizations actually work less well. And the way it gets through uh, the connection to capitalism is that um, in some ways this is based on a simplified and caricatured conception of what actually motivates people. Uh, so, you know, people are motivated to some degree by um, what we call external motivation. That is, they're motivated to some degree by the desire for money. But that's not the only thing that motivates them. Uh, and uh, to the extent that they're not, um, this focus on reward and punishment can be counterproductive, together with this kind of uh, scientism, that is, this notion that the more you measure things, the better off you'll be, which, as I say, leads you to ignore vast areas, important areas of life in organizations that can't be measured. And some of this started within business schools and was propagated by uh, business gurus and, uh, and uh, by consultants. And it started in the business sector, but then under the rubric of new public management, moved to the government sector and increasingly uh, influences the way in which, as I say, schools are managed and universities are ranked and so on. So uh, I would say it's one of the dysfunctions that contemporary capitalism brings with it. Mm -hmm. Very well. So, Dr. Muller, just before we finish this year, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work on the internet? And I also don't know if you're active on, on social media or not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are some videos of mine uh, on the internet. Uh, I did this set of 36 lectures some years ago for the teaching company called Thinking About Capitalism, which you can, which you have to pay for, but not very much, and it's available through the internet. Uh, I publish articles sometimes on the internet, actually quite a few recently in regard to the Tyranny of Metrics book. Uh, I have a Twitter handle, which is, um, I think, Jerry Z. Mueller. And uh, 
those are the ways in which they can um, come in contact with my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, Dr. Okay. Mueller, uh, I've been a big, fa a big fan of yours for several years, years now, so it was really a pleasure to meet you and to talk to you, and thank you a lot for accepting the invitation. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even $1, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peralga Larson and Lau Guerrero. Thank you very much for all.